Welcome to the 700 Club. Fatigue, trouble breathing, brain fog, and blackouts. These are just some of the symptoms suffered by one out of three people who've contracted COVID. They're also 40% more likely to develop diabetes. Well, this mysterious condition is called long COVID, and the Biden administration is now making an all-out effort to fight it. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson explains. While the U.S. is experiencing an uptick in COVID cases, the federal government is turning its attention to people who recovered from COVID but are left with strange, often debilitating symptoms that remain for months, even years. But once I got COVID and now on the other side of it, all I have now is my faith, my family, and a few friends. Marjorie Roberts experienced a loss in quality of life when her long COVID symptoms took hold. Losing my breath, exhausting, a level of fatigue that I had never in my life experienced. It was just so many different things. Shelby Boyd tells a similar story. Being in bed for about six months and having just chronic pain. Um, I had tremors. I had blackouts. Like millions with long COVID, Marjorie and Shelby hope to recapture the life they enjoyed before COVID. I rode horses. I was a super busybody. I'd been in the business world for the last eight years working. The CDC estimates one third of people who had COVID 19 have lingering symptoms such as shortness of breath, fatigue, and brain fog. There's so much interest and attention around long COVID now, as there should be, because it's affecting so many of us. Early research shows similarities between brains affected by long COVID and those of chemotherapy and Alzheimer's patients. COVID almost certainly affects what we call the blood-brain barrier. And as you may know, normally there's really a tight seal that keeps toxins and various kinds of chemicals we don't want, you know, out of our brain and in our blood. But COVID seems to weaken that. And it's not just the brain. A new study shows people who've had COVID are 40 percent more likely to develop diabetes within a year than those not infected. The science is definitely starting to demonstrate this link between people who've previously had COVID and um, increasing rates of new diabetes diagnoses. Public health leaders say they're expanding research into long COVID to better understand its causes, potential treatment, and how to support patients suffering from it. Long COVID is real, and there is still so much we don't know about it. Diana Barrett founded Survivor Corps, offering support to people with long COVID. We have over 200,000 members, and sadly, it is just growing and growing and growing. And I should also mention that children are not spared. So while the medical community has been primarily focused on preventing hospitalization and death, they're now confronting the mysterious condition affecting people who survived acute COVID but are left with something that in many cases is much worse. Gordon? Well, Lori, why do some people get long COVID and others don't? Is it, is it based on how severe the initial infection is? That's a great question, and it is one of the most perplexing questions facing scientists right now. And the answer is no. You would think that, but with all we know about COVID up until this point, that the people who get long COVID are people who are generally less healthy. That is absolutely not the case. What we're seeing is many people who are young and healthy getting long COVID, people and who, are, uh, who even had mild cases of COVID or even asymptomatic cases are getting long COVID. Now, the symptoms and the duration, they vary. And uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't really affect people the same way. Some people have sort of mild, long COVID symptoms, but some people's symptoms are so bad that they can't even work. In fact, Gordon, the Brookings Institution estimates that 15 percent of the unfilled jobs right now are due to people who have long COVID and can't work. Well, what's the link to diabetes? Uh, diabetes, we, we know, is one of the risk factors that if you have diabetes and you get COVID, you're more likely to be hospitalized, you're more likely to die. Now we're hearing that diabetes can actually be triggered by COVID. What's the link? 
That's absolutely true. And so that's one of the things that scientists are studying. There are people who are suffering all types of problems with long COVID. And so doctors really don't have a standard of care right now. They don't have a cure. But there are these uh, post-COVID care centers, hundreds of them, all over the country right now. And uh, the Survivor Corps lists them all. And for that list, you can go to our website, cbnnews.com. There's one here in our area at Centera Norfolk General Hospital. And so one thing that uh, they've noticed is Survivor Corps polled its members and found out that 40 percent of them, their symptoms went away or dissipated in a, in a large way after they got vaccinated. So that's not a scientific study, but it was dramatic enough to warrant a scientific study right now that Yale is doing. So still so many questions that need to be answered the diabetes questions, and so many others. So you're saying this is sort of like shingles, that you can have uh, chicken pox in your youth and then later develop shingles, but you can prevent it uh, by getting a shingles vaccine. So there'll be a long COVID vaccine? Well, they're really not sure uh, what the vaccine link is. So there are people who had long COVID. They, they, they had COVID. They were not vaccinated. They got COVID. Then they had long COVID. And then they got vaccin vaccinated. And 40% of them, their symptoms dissipated or went away. That's not a scientific study. The symptoms could have gone away for a different reason. So that's why Yale is actually doing this scientific study. So that's one more sort of piece to the puzzle is what what kind of an influence do vaccines have on long COVID? All right, well, let's talk about BA2. We've left the Greek al alphabet, going back to the normal alphabet, because we've lost track of all the variants. I confess I've really let my defenses down in terms of trying to prevent uh, getting it on the basis that BA2 is, is sort of like a bad cold. Uh, the new variants aren't as severe, but at the same time, it, it can can the BA2 variant lead to long COVID and and are collectively are we walking into a real problem if one third of the people that get BA2 can develop long COVID symptoms? So are we going to see a surge in long COVID because of BA2? Well, it's uh, difficult to predict, but we know that people who have gotten all the previous variants have gotten long COVID. So BA2 is on the rise. It's 30% more transmissible than Omicron. BA2 is actually a sub-variant of Omicron. And so we're seeing an increase in cases. Philadelphia, for example, just reinstated their indoor mask mandate. Health officials expect the case numbers to start going up and possibly peak in July. A lot of people do have some level of immunity, which is encouraging, and hopefully that will protect people against severe disease and death. Well, Lori, thanks for the insights. Thanks for the report. If you want updates on this, all you have to do is go to cbnnews.com. Uh, we want to keep you informed, and if, like me, you've been letting your defenses down, you might want to rethink that in terms of what are the implications of getting long COVID. In other news, the latest numbers are out and inflation continues to rise. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. Today's consumer price index shows inflation reaching its highest level, continuing its months-long stubborn streak of rising prices. Inflation soaring 8.5% over the last year, the biggest year-over-year -year increase since 1981, and prices rose 1.2% from February to March. The White House blaming the jump on the war in Ukraine and its impact on gas and oil prices. Economists have been expecting the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates more than previously expected, with many concerned that the rising rates could slow down the economy and lead to a recession. Well, to the latest in the war in Ukraine, after meeting face-to-face -face with Vladimir Putin Monday, Austria's chancellor described their time together as unfriendly and tough. Meanwhile, the United States is working to confirm unverified reports of a Russian chemical attack on the besieged city of Mariupol. CBN's Jenna Browder has more. If the use of chemical weapons is confirmed in Ukraine, it could mark a major escalation and turning point in this war. The Pentagon says it's closely monitoring the unconfirmed reports. On social media, a paramilitary battalion incorporated into Ukraine's National Guard is accusing the Kremlin of using a drone to drop a poisonous substance in the city of Mariupol. 
This is a spokesman for Moscow-backed forces in the disputed region of Donetsk. Call on Russia to use chemical forces in the city. Ukraine's President Zelensky says the statement testifies to Russia's planning of a new stage of terror against his country. NATO's Secretary General has said this kind of attack would totally change the conflict. And it will be a blatant violation of uh, international law and will have far-reaching consequences. Meanwhile, Mariupol's mayor says as many as 20,000 people have been killed in the besieged city. On the diplomatic front, Austria's chancellor is now the first EU leader to meet with Vladimir Putin face to face since the invasion began. The chancellor calling the meeting unfriendly and tough after raising the issue of Russian atrocities. And President Biden met virtually with India's prime minister to discuss limiting Russian oil imports and pressuring Putin to end the fighting. And this week, multiple members of Congress will be in Eastern Europe. House Leader Cindy Hoyer and Kevin McCarthy are leading bipartisan groups to meet with Ukrainian refugees in a show of solidarity with NATO and Europe. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. Well, more than six weeks into the war, Ukrainian refugees continue to cross the border into Poland. CBN's Operation Blessing is there to greet them with food and a place to rest and recover before continuing on their journey. Hello and welcome to the Operation Blessing relief tent here at Medica border, uh, just uh, very close to the Ukraine here where people are crossing from uh, Ukraine into Poland to get to safety. And it's, we've been here for several weeks now and it's still, still very busy at times. Uh, and it comes in waves and, and today is again very busy and we are having many more people coming through this uh, corridor to find their way to the buses. And, and while they're making their way, people can come into our tent here, which is uh, a wonderful place for them to recover and to rest and to charge their mobile phones and also to uh, receive hot drinks and hot food, which we're preparing there in our food truck, and also to receive those hygiene kits. And these include uh, like shampoo, um, hand sanitizer, baby shampoo and toothbrushes and other things that will help them as they're finding a place for the night. And we'd like to thank you so much as uh, CBN Operation Blessing Partners for your help to make this all possible. Uh, without you, we couldn't do what we're doing. So we're so thankful on behalf of all the people who are helping. A huge thank you and God bless you. Operation Blessing offering a glimmer of hope in challenging times, Gordon. If you've been a part of the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund, thank you. Thank you for your gifts, for your care and concern for those refugees. We're there in your name when you give to that fund. If, you're, if you haven't given, I invite you to do it. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. You can text OB Crisis to 71777, or you can go to CBN.com. There's a place online where you can designate your gift to the Disaster Relief Fund. Either way, do it now. Be part of helping those people in need, and we're going to be there for the long term. Uh, this is going to be months, if not years, of recovery. We need your help to do that. Call us. 1-800. 700, 7,000. Well, just imagine trees sprouting from seeds that are 2,000 years old. Seems impossible, but it's not. In the middle of Israel's era of a desert, botanists have taken ancient date palm seeds and nurtured them to life. Now those palms are bearing fruit. Chris Mitchell has the story. This little young looking palm tree named Judith carries an ancient heritage. We're talking about the resurrection of 2,000 year old plus ancient date seeds that come from the Judean desert and from Matsada and which are part of a scientific experiment. Growing in a greenhouse for the last nine years, Judith was recently transplanted in what Kibbutz Keturah calls the ancient Judean date orchard. Journalists even pitched in to help She's the fifth such tree to be planted there after Methuselah, Adam, Jonah, and Hannah. We are planting our second female date tree who was sprouted from an ancient seed. Actually, this one came from Qumran, was found in the caves, and uh, much to our astonishment, she also sprouted. Hannah is the first female tree. She was planted outside in 2019, pollinated by Methuselah. Hannah had around 100 dates last year. This year, she had more than 600. 
Dr. Sarah Salone, a medical doctor, started this project more than 15 years ago after becoming interested in natural medicine. I wanted to see how medicinal the flora of Israel was and what it had been used for and so on. And then I realized that many of these species had actually disappeared. And we know what there was because it's mentioned in the Bible. The Bible is our guidebook of ancient species. One that disappeared centuries ago was the Judean date. It's mentioned in the Bible as one of the seven species found in the ancient land of Israel. We see dates all the way along here, palm trees and all the kibbutzim are growing plants and, and look at the plantations on Keturah. Those date palms of modern day Israel are modern and they were imported after the founding of the state in the 1950s, but they're not the original date tree that grew here. Years ago at Masada, archeologists found a jar of those ancient date seeds. In ancient times, the classical writers described in detail the dates of ancient Judea. Why? Because they were famous. They were big, they were sweet, they were very dry, that allowed them to be exported all over the Roman Empire, and they had medicinal qualities. Salone obtained five of those original seeds and gave them to botanist Dr. Elaine Salaway. After devising a method to sprout them, Salaway has succeeded in sprouting seeds found in other places, such as the Qumran caves, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. I think the biggest problem is hydrating them, because if you hydrate them too quickly, you kill them, and you only get one crack at each seed. So far, we have five males and two females, seven altogether, and I've tried lots of seeds, and most of them are deader than doornails. Fifteen years ago, the first tree Salaway sprouted was a male. They called him Methuselah, after the oldest person in the Bible. CBN News got its first look ten years ago, when Methuselah was still in the lab. More than 850,000 date trees grow in Israel. Salaway planted some 3,000 of them on Kibbutz Ketorah, where each tree produces around 350 pounds of dates a year. Salaway and Salone are hoping eventually to add the revived Judean dates to the harvest. We are going to be testing those dates in the future to see actually what they do and whether they differ from other commercial varieties of modern dates. So for the kibbutz, it's a big venture. Dr. Tarek Abu Hamad, director of the Arava Institute, sees this as planting seeds from the past to bear a special kind of needed fruit for the future. If you don't look back to the history, you will not see the future. And here we're actually planting history at the, at the Arava Institute. We hope one day that with these trees that came from 2,000 years ago will be the hope of peace in, uh, in our region. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. What an incredible miracle. Seeds 2,000 years old sprouting uh, is absolutely amazing to me. But wouldn't it be wonderful to restore the species that's written about in the Bible that was so fam famous in the ancient world, the Judean date? I'm a real date fan. I love them. I really have a real fondness for the Iraqi Majul date. Uh, but it would be great to have the Judean date back in the diet. That would be a wonderful thing. So these are just proof that when the Bible says the desert will bloom again, we're literally seeing it before our eyes. We're seeing these things happen. Uh, that This was a wasteland 70 years ago, and now we're seeing it bloom, become fruitful, and fruitful once again. Terry? Helen Smallbone is the matriarch of a musical dynasty that includes recording artists for King and Country and Rebecca St. James. Their journey to hard-won success has always been a family affair. Take a look. Helen Smallbone is an author, co-founder of Mum Life Community, and a podcast host on Access More. She's also the mother of seven and grandmother to 14. A few of her children include Rebecca St. James, and for King and Country singers, Joel and Luke Smallbone. Even though the Smallbone family has known great success, times weren't always easy. During their toughest trials, they learned to work together to not only survive, but thrive. In her book, Behind the Lights, Helen shares their inspirational journey, encouraging you to always trust God, regardless of what you're facing. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Helen Smallbone. Helen, it's wonderful to have you with us. 
Thank you for having me. Your journey as a family has been quite remarkable, but let's go back a little bit to the beginning. Your husband, David, broke into the music business in Australia, and after mm -hmm. some success, what happened? Well, we actually um, promoted a tour back in Australia, and uh, we lost uh, about a quarter of a million dollars on the tour. And we'd had losses before, but nothing like this. And uh, so we knew this was going to be major life change. And so we were looking for other avenues of which to uh, sort of continue work because he loves Christian music and we tried to continue in other avenues. We had two more doors closed and we were basically at a loss as to knowing what to do. So God opened one door and that was to come to America. So we, uh, we arrived in America in August um, 1991. 30 years ago, um, we had six kids. I was pregnant with our seventh, and uh, we had 16 suitcases, and that was our new life. Wow. The beginnings. You, your family of eight came here. You had no car, no furniture, no house, <laughs> two suitcases <laughs> per person. Tell me how you managed. I mean, when you, what did you do when you got here? <laughs> well, fortunately, we, we managed to get a, a rental home. Uh, we had no furniture, as you said. We had no car. And you don't survive much in America without a car. We had neighbours then love on us, really. We had the local community love on us. Uh, we had people who would drop groceries on the doorstep. Um, we had a neighbour who would loan us their car. We eventually had somebody who felt that God was telling him to give us their brand new um, minivan. And we just, if people... And really, it was a church. We furnished our house. We loved on us. If people hadn't have loved on us, we would have gone home. We, we were living hand to mouth. The kids were working. Uh, we ended up starting to rake lawns, and that's how we got known by the community. And then Rebecca was cleaning homes with me, um, babysitting. Daniel was working at a flea market, and eventually we were doing a bit of a lawn business. And it was really the kids who put food on the table in those early days until uh, Rebecca got signed. You know, as I read your book, the thing that I marveled about was your ability to all stay together. I mean, a lot of marriages wouldn't have survived that. A lot of families wouldn't have survived that. But as you just mentioned, your children really engaged in what needed to be done to sur survive. Talk about some of the lessons that they learned from the struggle. Well, we really learn to rely on each other. And I think you're on the other side of the world, no family, no friends, a uh, few business acquaintances. Uh, we're building new relationships. And so we just really learned that we had each other. We had God. So we would gather in the living room um, and just pray for things that we need. And the kids actually saw God provide. And you don't have experiences like that where you see God's provision, where you rely on him, you see answered prayer. You don't have experiences like that without um, it changing you and it changing you for forever. And really, I think that is the foundation. Our foundation of losing everything and having God give it back is the foundation of Rebecca's career and then following on that because the boys started working for Rebecca. Joel, we, we ended up being crew for Rebecca, really, because in 1994, when she got signed, uh, we'd only been here a few years. We were homeschooling. We were working together we realized how much we needed one another. And so when it got time to do tours, David decided that he had a pretty good free crew in the boys, <laughs> uh, ranging from 14 down to, I don't know, Josh might've been about four. Um, and so we, we ended up going out together and he had, um, Daniel at 14, 15, learned how to do all the lights. Um, ben started to learn how to do sound. We brought in a, a cousin who was about Rebecca's age and they did sound together. So they just ended up learning how to do the ropes. And so it just continued on. Uh, we continued working with Rebecca through most of her career. We traveled with her. And then um, as the boys started being called into doing music on their own, they were Rebecca's support act as well as Joel was always Rebecca's stage manager as well as background singer and that's how really everything got birthed. I want to mention that Luke and Joel actually wrote a song for you I think appropriately titled Unsung Hero because you kind of were the glue that held everybody together. We're going to hear some of that as you tell us about it. Talk about that song. Um, I 
I didn't even, you know, I, these days I'm a little now disconnected from the, from the, what the boys do. And this song was dedicated, I think, to me. Um, but it really covers the gamut of what a mum does. And she's an unsung hero. Yes, yeah, she really is. She really is. And you really were. And isn't it, it must be very satisfying to you to know that your children saw that quality in you because sometimes that can be a very rare quality as everybody strives to get what they want out of life. You really invested yourself in your children. Talk about your passion today, mom life. No, my passion, uh, you've got to understand, Terry, I de dedicated my life to serving the family, really. I, I, you know, actively mothered for 32 years between the time that I started, had Rebecca, and then our youngest, Libby, um, was uh, graduated from high school. And you obviously never stop being a mum. So I, um, I realised my passion was there, and about 10 years ago, God really graciously started me uh, working at the local um, uh, church that we were attending, and I, we then eventually we set up our own organisation called Mum Life Community and had the opportunity now to do podcasts. But my passion, the foundation of our society, my passion is mums because they're the, they and the family. And so I want to instill back and encourage younger mums on their journey. And really the book is part of that. Um, I know that mums need all the encouragement they can get and when they look at our journey, ours was a pretty extreme journey, but God's been faithful and God's been good. And he has led us on a new path that was not our plan at all, but he took us down a direction and now we can see the fruit from, from the, my labour, I suppose, the, being faithful as a family. And then we can actually, I want to now instill that. In, in other, in other mums. Well, there's your family. It's really quite remarkable how really God used you as the core of all of that because your husband was busy off keeping the plates <laughs> up on the spinning, the spinning plates on the sticks. Thank you so much, Helen, for being with us. I want to let our viewers know that your book is called Behind the Lights and it's available wherever books are sold. Helen Smallbone, what a remarkable family. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN Newsbreak. Christians praised the decision of a court in Finland to dismiss charges of hate speech against a Finnish Christian lawmaker. Now it appears the battle is coming back. Paivi Rosinen once again could face charges for posting material, including scripture, on what the Bible says about homosexuality. Prosecutors reportedly intend to appeal the Helsinki District Court's reversal, which threw out the case. Rosinen is said to be dismayed by the decision, but insists she's ready to resume the fight to defend Finland's freedoms of speech and religion. Well, nearly two months after Russia invaded Ukraine, evangelist Franklin Graham is returning to the war-torn country. He tweeted, I'll be going back to Ukraine to preach an Easter message that will air on Fox News Easter Sunday, April 17th at noon Eastern. Graham traveled to Ukraine early last month where his humanitarian ministry, Samaritan's Purse, set up a medical facility in Lviv. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. A storm tore the roof off a shanty where Gisela and her children live. They ran for their lives, fearing the whole house would collapse on them. Gisela was already struggling after the pandemic shut down her business, and now her family had nowhere to live. Gisela is a single mom raising her daughter, son, and a granddaughter in a remote community in Peru. Before COVID hit, she earned money for food by selling handmade crafts in a tourist town called Iquitos. When the pandemic hit, all international travel stopped and her business dried up. With that, I support my children. Honestly, when I don't sell, I don't eat. To make things even more challenging, the roof of the shanty where they've been living for 22 years was torn off by strong winds and rain. My oldest daughter started crying when she saw the roof blow away. I will never forget what we went through. All of her clothes and my handicrafts got wet. I thought the house was going to fall down on us. I left everything there and ran to safety with my children. When Operation Blessing came to help members of the community affected by the pandemic, 
We provided training and new materials for Gisela to begin making and selling crafts again. I learned to weave better. I learned how to make bracelets, bags, earrings, and necklaces. Then Operation Blessing built Gisela and her family a new house with a kitchen, bathroom, and new beds. I have never lived in a house like this, only a hut. God has given me a house where my children live in peace without fear of storms. This is six-year-old Jose. Now I can sleep without getting wet. I am happy in my new house. And as restrictions have lifted and tourists are returning, Gisela said she's now selling her crafts again. I can produce and sell even more handicrafts than before, and I can buy food for my children. I'm grateful to God and to everyone who made these gifts possible. That thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club because you help that wonderful family. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. It's $20 a month. That's the cost. That breaks out to just 65 cents a day. And you're joining with tens of thousands of people that say, yes, let's make a difference. Let's help people in their time of need. You can join at higher levels. We have 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. We also have 1,000 Club. That's $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. The bank doing all the work, and we can send as our gift to you. Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you like those, ask for Pledge Express when you, when you call, or you can go to CBN.com. When you give monthly on the internet, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. We have a new text to give where you can text the letters CBN to 71777. Now, when you call and join, uh, I've got something for you. It's my father's latest book. It's The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. It's yours for a gift of $20 a month or more. I want you to have this. It distills down 60 years of ministry, how he would ask God for direction in his life, my mother and father would get together and pray and pray in agreement, and then God would speak to them through scriptures. He would show them what he would, uh, wanted them to do, what he wanted CBN to do, what he wanted Regent University to do, what he wanted Operation Blessing to do. It became a bedrock for all that, that grew up over the last 60 years. It's an amazing book, an amazing instruction manual, if you will, so you can understand how to apply God's power in your life. I want you to have it. It's yours when you join. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. Melanie was eight years old when her house burned down. She and her family had to move into a motel, and that's when Melanie was abducted and sexually molested. She never told anyone what happened, and that buried secret almost destroyed her. All of these things, plus the surmounting pressure of not dealing with anything from my childhood, there was no way forward. I had to take my own life. Melanie Walden grew up with five siblings in a house full of turmoil and abuse. Her parents used drugs and alcohol to cope with life. By the time I was seven or eight, I had been on a motorcycle accident and third degree burns. There was a knife fight between my mother and my brother. One of my brothers shot the other one. It was really dark and scary. When she was eight years old, however, she had the opportunity to attend a Christian camp. I experienced lightness for the first time. So I'm swimming, being loved on. I, I met Jesus and we had chapel every day and I would walk forward and sing, you know, um, surrender songs to the Lord and pray that he would save me. The uplifting camp experience was soon erased when she returned to her chaotic life. Our house had burned down to the ground. And so the eight of us were living in a motel. It was around that time that I was abducted. I was taken into a car. I was sexually overcome. Melanie was let go later that night and never told anyone. She buried that secret trauma and began to form her own coping mechanisms. I was operating even into my adulthood for decades based on lies that had taken hold because of these things that had happened in my youth, that I was worthless, that the sum total of everything in life was really loss. 
and that no one could be trusted. These kinds of lies um, is what I based my adult life on, really. Melanie tried to escape her broken past by creating her idea of a perfect future. I, you know, just strove for perfection. Just had to be the best at everything I did. I had married a man who looked perfect on the outside, kind of checked all the boxes. It just looked like this perfect couple. I went to work and got a position at a corporate job. I was promoted to director of a Fortune 500 company by the time I was 27. She had a son and felt solely responsible to raise him while trying to maintain the appearance of perfection. Before long, the pressure was too much. All of these things, plus the surmounting pressure of not dealing with anything from my childhood, I could see no way forward. There really was nothing else for me to do but to leave, but to escape this life. Melanie was about to overdose on pills when suddenly she felt compelled to call 911. She was admitted to a hospital where she had a nervous breakdown. Soon after, she began making changes, looking for hope. Yet her old ways of thinking were still deeply ingrained. I separated from my husband, ended up getting wooed into a really horrible relationship. And that really started a series of perpetual uh, harm uh, against myself um, through relationships I got into physically abusive and sexually abusive relationships. I thought, well, that's really what life is like, right? Because that's that was my upbringing, crisis. I just thought that that's how it was supposed to be. I had to give up my son, who was, you know, the person I loved the most, for his well-being. And so I had nothing else. I had nothing else. I gave up my house, gave up everything. Melanie rented a home near a church and started attending regularly. As she began to experience real change, she was able to get her son back, and they served together on the worship team. We were both living at that home and, and going to church, and in those Sunday mornings, it was like camp. It was lightness again. And the songs, a lot of them were the same, and I just started being wooed by God. That's how it felt. Over time, Melanie says she gave her heart to Jesus and is thankful for her new life in Christ. I think for me, it required surrendering everything and getting to a point where I had nothing to lose. And he just redeemed everything. He put my feet on solid ground, you know, and steadied me as I walked along. He gave me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our Lord. And it's because of him. It's because he restores and he renewed me and he gave me new life. Today, Melanie is married and is sharing her love for Jesus through ministry and music. All of this is a gift from God who's brought us back to himself through Christ, and he's given us this task of reconciling others to himself. I am a precious child of God, perfectly and wonderfully made. God wants me to be happy and full of the love of the Father, being fully who he created me to be. I am blessed, and I base my life on these truths now, and my life is abundant. Your life can be abundant, too. You can leave behind all those things in your past, and you can declare, just as Melanie was able to declare, to declare she was singing it out, look at what love has done. There is a God who loves you. He's not distanced from you. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't forsaken you. He's right there with you. He wants you to just turn to him and give him all of these things because he's able to take it. You can leave it all at the cross. You can leave all the rejection, all the struggle, all the strife, all the hurt, all the pain, all the wounds. You can leave it all with him. And then he comes in and says, I'll fix it. I'll love you. Look at what love 
has done. Now, for Melanie, I think it's a, a story that a lot of people share, that you get used to crisis, that you grow up with conflict. Melanie had extreme conflict. I, I've never heard of a family where a son tries to have a knife, knife fight with his mother, but that's what happened to her. And, you know, the house burned down. She, they go to a motel, motel and, and she, she said, this is just how I thought it should be that it became normal for her. And because she thought it was how it should be, she would actually generate crisis in her, her adult life because that's how it should be. Uh, that's what I'm used to. And maybe you're like that. And maybe you've gotten into recurring behavior patterns that you know are destructive, that aren't leading to peace, that aren't leading to security, but you keep cycling through them again and again and again. And you keep wondering, why am I doing this? I know this doesn't work, but I feel compelled to do it. What she said is a great key. This is how I thought it should be. I challenge you, change that thinking, that you can have a life of abundance, you can have a life of love, you can feel cherished by your maker. Jesus loves you. And here's one of the great revelations I received. He loves you tenderly as a little child. He loves you so much, he was willing to die for you. He loves you individually. He's willing to leave the 99. He's willing to leave all of that just for you, the one he seeks you out. He wants you to be with him for all eternity. And he's willing to melt your heart, all the hardness, all the wounds, all the secret places you've walled off. He's willing to do all of that because he loves you. And he wants you tenderly. All you have to do to get this, to get this revelation, because it is a revelation, all you have to do is ask for it. So just what Melanie did, you know, Jesus, can you save me? Can you be my Messiah? Can you be the one that I know is with me? Can you open my eyes that I could see it? Could you open my ears that I could hear your voice? Could you give me a heart of understanding that I may know the greatness of your power, and I'll add to that verse, the greatness of your love towards me. Faith always works through love. And when you have that revelation of his love, you have everything you need. If you want this, bow your head with me, pray a very simple prayer, and let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus. I come to you, and I want to know your love. I want to experience it. I want to know how tenderly you love me, how precious I am in your sight. And Jesus, if you'll do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer. Come into my heart, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to call us and get a free packet. What do you do now? It's called A New Day, and in it, it's a CD teaching. How do you live the Christian life? Here's a word for Matthew. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will find it.